this morning from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25, beginning in verse 31. Jesus says, when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And He will put the sheep at His right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, When was it that we saw you hungry or gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, When was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is the word of God for the people of God. Our passage today imagines a setting in the future when the Son of Man will come in His glory. It imagines a time when the suffering of the people has ended, when the Roman occupation is no longer there, when the poor and the oppressed and the downtrodden have been vindicated. It is a call for justice, fairness, and vindication. It is hope shaped into the form of a story. The contrast in the story is between the righteous and the unrighteous, or between the doers and the non-doers. Notice that the criteria has nothing to do with power or political prowess or earthly wealth or social status or privilege. The criteria outlined in this parable today When talking about righteousness, says righteousness is based on simple, everyday acts of kindness offered to the least in society. Now, the irony of the passage is that neither group gets it. Neither of them make connections between what they do to other people or how they interact with other people and their relationship to God or the Lord or the King as the parable has it. They don't see the connection. They both ask, well, when? When did we do this? Or when did we not do this? When did that happen? Jesus offers them this radical idea that how they treat the least among us, in fact, has everything to do with their relationship with the Lord or the King. That these two things are intimately connected hear it again in verse 37 they ask lord when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink and when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing and when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you and the king will answer them truly i tell you just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family you did it to me 
just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family. You did it to me. The theological implication is we're all a part of the same family. The king says you're all a part of my family. Well, we could extrapolate we're all a part of the family of Christ. The model for living in the kingdom of heaven, Jesus says, is to be ready, is to be ready to serve the least among us. Whether it's a morsel of food or a cup of cool water to drink, whether it's clothing for one in need or welcoming one that we do not know who is a stranger in our midst or visiting one who is ill or imprisoned. These simple acts of kindness make all the difference. It seems that Jesus is saying that we should treat everyone as if they are the Lord or the Christ. That we should treat each and every person we meet as if they're anointed by God. For they are. Because we're all children of God. Created by God as beloved children in the family of God. Do you know the story of the conversion of Francis of Assisi? He grew up in a wealthy family. As a young adult, when trying to decide what to do, he took up the military life, thinking it was a proud way and a gallant way to protect his family and his village. But in his very first battle... He was taken as a prisoner of war and thrown into jail. He languished there for a year. He became extremely ill on the edge of death, finally released from prison and was able to make it back home where he took another year or so until he recovered. Once he was feeling strong again, he signed up for another military campaign. But this time as they were marching to the battle, Francis had a vision he felt like God was telling him he was going in the wrong direction and he should turn around and go home and prepare for a new kind of knighthood. And so Francis dropped out of the military and returned home, trying to wait, to listen, to prepare. He began to dedicate himself to times of solitude and times of prayer trying to discern the way to go he began to give up worldly possessions and adopted an attitude and a lifestyle of poverty he had opportunity to go to rome he went to rome and was in the square outside of saint peter's basilica he and other beggars there worshiping if you will but also begging for alms. At one point, he had some alms that people had given him, and another man was next to him that had none, and he reached out and gave him some. He realized that the man was also a leper. He later confesses that before this moment in his life, he had always thought of lepers with repugnance but he said he was overcome with compassion that day and reached out and grabbed the man's hand and kissed it I don't think it's too strong to say it was a moment in his life where he was serving the least of these he said in that moment, God took something that was bitter within him and made it sweet in body and soul. He returned home, still living this lifestyle of poverty in some ways, still trying to discern what God was calling him to do. And one day he was visiting an abandoned church and there was a crucifix on the wall and Francis had another vision or another mystical experience where he says he heard Jesus from the cross saying to him, rebuild my church, rebuild my church. And Francis took it literally and began to repair the abandoned church that was falling apart on the very site in which he had heard this. 
He was working on this, and during this period where he was working to rebuild the physical structure of the church, he was in worship. The year was 1208. Francis is still in his late 20s, and he heard the Scripture reading that day, which came from Matthew just earlier in the Gospel from where we read back in chapter 10. He heard the priest read these verses that day. Jesus is sending out the 12 disciples and says, As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for laborers deserve their food. Whatever town or village you enter, find out who in it is worthy and stay there until you leave. As you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet as you leave that house or town. Truly, I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. At the end of that service, Francis stood up and said to all gathered there, that is what I am seeking. That is the call of God on my life. He took off his sandals, since it said, take no sandals. He left his staff. He turned in his fancy tunic for a rough tunic and said, I'm dedicating myself to a life of poverty and to preaching the good news as Jesus instructed the disciples to do, to tell others that the kingdom of heaven has come near. From that moment on, Francis followed that kind of simple lifestyle and simple proclamation of the gospel. If we stay with chapter 10 in that same section where Matthew's telling us about this sermon or this commission that Jesus gives at the very end of chapter 10 and verse 40, Jesus concludes like this, whoever welcomes you welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. Can you not hear the same themes that we just read about in chapter 25? About the preeminent importance of welcome and hospitality. Whether it's at home or on the street, whether it's a morsel of food or a cup of cold water. Whether it's welcoming a stranger or visiting someone who is sick or in prison. These simple acts of kindness, Jesus seems to be saying, make up the righteous life. The righteous life, the blessed life, is one which blesses others with these simple acts of hosting, of helping, of extending hospitality to one in need. In our children's department, this fall, they're following this curriculum that talks about the beloved, be kind and be you. Be loved, be kind, be you. The text they're using is from Ephesians. I want to read you a few verses from what they've been using in their department. It says, but God, who is rich in mercy out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. 
For by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. And then they're reading this verse every week in their chapel services. For we are what God has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Hear this good news, my friends. You are loved by God. And this love being poured into you makes it possible for you to do the good works of kindness of which Jesus speaks. So often, Christians and others get this confused and think we have to do good works so that God will love us. But that sequence is backwards. It's rather that God loves us. And as we receive that love of God, that empowers us to do good works, goods of works of kindness and goodness for others. In fact, this is salvation, this claiming and receiving the love of God and living a life that's shaped by love's by God's love and mercy and grace. That is the conversion of our hearts to those that are fully loving and ready to serve others. This salvation, or God's love that makes us whole, is available to all. And therefore, we can all share it with someone else. You don't have to be a pastor to be kind. You don't have to be a trained theologian or a biblical scholar to serve someone else. You don't have to be here logging hours at the church every week to serve somebody else with a morsel of food or a cup of water for those who are parched. On this Christ the King Sunday, we proclaim that Christ is the Lord of life and the Lord of love. And we hope that we can all claim that He's the ruler, the King of our hearts, and that we can form our life to His way of loving kindness. The gospel reminds us over and over, receiving this great love of God transforms us into people who are ever more loving and ready to radiate this divine love that's been poured into our lives. And when that happens, love abounds in our life, but also abounds in the world because of our witness. I'll end with this story this morning that I read recently about a race. Now, we've all heard of foot races where we're going to run a certain distance, and the first one there wins. It could be 100 yards or 200 yards or a 5K or 10K or like a marathon. Some of you drove past this morning on your way down here. But in all of those, speed is the criteria. First one wins. But this race I read about is called Big Dogs Outdoor Ultra. And the criteria is not first one to a certain finish line. It's set up outdoors on a four-mile loop, and the winner is the last one still running. No preset distance. You just keep going until you're the only one left. The winners say the right attitude is not, I have so many more miles to go like in a normal race. It's rather a better question to ask is, can I do one more loop? Can I just do one more loop? Can I go one more time? Applied to our passage today, then the best question is not, can I feed the world or can I end homelessness forever The question, according to the parable, is can I feed one more? Can I give one more cup of water? Will I welcome one more into the family of faith? So much easier to say, oh, yes, I can do one more. Oh, I'll do one more. And Jesus says, when we say yes like that, then the king will say, come, You that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. 
May it be so. Amen, and thanks be to God.